Taylor Gerolstein is a private land biologist with P TPWD, originally from Corpus Christi. Taylor obtained his bachelor's in range and wildlife management from Texas right, A&M University, Kingsville, and his master's in range and wildlife management from Sewell Ross State University, Alpine. He has a deep interest in wildlife, plants, ranching, and most aspects of outdoor recreation. His primary role with TPWD is to work with private landowners to help better their land for wildlife. Taylor, come talk. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm not good with mics, so I have to make this work. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, all right, let's let's jump into it. Um, I can get to. All right, so a little bit of background. As mentioned, I grew up in Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, not too far from the coast. Um, also, we had a family ranch in the southern hill country, uh, Uvalde County. So we're right there on the on the edge of Edwards Plateau in the South Texas Plains. And uh, growing up in Corpus, I uh, was recommended with my interest in the outdoors to go to Kingsville, Texas and Kingsville, and study range and wildlife management. And so I spent four years there uh, doing everything I could to to gain and get experience and work with a lot of research from from deer to quail to collared lizards to to plants and uh, a lot of other fun stuff too. And then um, following that, I went to Sol Ross State University in Alpine. Uh, that was from 2013 to, to 15. My primary study was pronghorn antelope in the Marfa Plateau. And so uh, we studied pronghorn from the panhandle that were translocated to the Transpecus for, for restoration and research purposes. Uh, so in 2015, I was hired somehow by Texas Parks and Wildlife, and I applied for three different jobs, and they were fortunate enough to get this one here. Uh, I covered Dallas, Ellis, Kaufman, Navarro, and a little bit in Freestone County. And our district goes from the Red River down to College Station, a really narrow band, post Oak Savannah, Black Lone Prairie region primarily. And I do some work in the Piney Woods as well uh, with my role with fire and, and uh, uh, landowner work as well. So my goal today, and this is going to be geared towards y'all. So if you have any questions or, you know, kind of want to steer this along some way we can, somehow I ended up with 113 slides. So uh, I was told I had an hour and 45 minutes. So I hope you brought plenty of coffee. Bad joke. So, uh, but I just want to talk to this and show y'all kind of what my goals are with landowners in Texas. I also do some stuff with groups like Master Naturalists and MPAT and now MPSOT. But, uh, but I have a large, broad base of folks that I try to work with and that reach out. So, hopefully, I can relate what I do on the landscape on private ranches, state land, federal land, et cetera, with with big areas to to your background, your backyard, or your local park, your ranchette. Um, demonstration garden, as mentioned. Uh, but really what it's all about for wildlife and just good diversity is maximizing usable space. You know, so every bit of ground you have, try to make that a mosaic, you know, create something different on each part of that, that plot or that ranch for, for one wildlife species or another and move that around. Mow, mow here one year, don't mow here, burn here, don't burn there. We won't do specifics on, on all those habitat type things that we do for wildlife, but I'll kind of broadly cover some of it. And then what tools you have at your disposal. So you know, are you able to burn your yard? It could be done. You never know. Can you, do you mow? Can you tie a goat to your tree? Um, do you have a shovel? All that good stuff. But the main thing is with any restoration, whether it's prairie or, you know, uh, doing something in your yard or a ranch, whatever, is to have goals. So make sure you know where you want to end up and how you're going to keep that once you're there. Because it never ends and it's not cheap to, to do something. So uh, but hopefully I can relate that to, to maximize wildlife in, in your landscape, your back 40, backyard, et cetera. So, uh, and of course, to benefit uh, our array of wildlife and birds. And so uh, you can't see the bottom right, but that is a, a Eastern meadowlark. Uh, these are some of the priority bird species that, that we look at in North Texas and the Hill Country as well, kind of the Oaks and Prairies area. And so a lot of the funding that comes to landowners and to what I try to do is the benefit dig thistles, painted bunnings, quail, et cetera. Uh, and to me, quail are kind of that focal bird. If you manage for quail, most other wildlife really like that. So including pollinators and of course the uh, pollinators that come with it. And uh, we'll jump into that later a little bit too. So survey time, uh, raise your hand if you own land, more than a half acre lot. Okay, so less than hundred acres, hands up. Okay, sure, uh, over a hundred acres. No, that's fine. Okay, maybe some on the chat do. Uh, have you ever completed or took part in a prairie restoration? 
which I mean quite a few have. Okay, good. Um, Y'all can leave now if you've done that. So that's mainly what I'll talk about today, but uh, again, bad joke, I'm good at those. So we'll cover some foundation on, on the needs of living things, wildlife, you know, what they need, pretty simple concepts, roles of plants in these needs, and then plant relationships. So some things we probably learned back in school, we might really know now or study now, but uh, the importance of structure, how plants are laid out on, on a particular landscape. And then scale, you know, what does that look like across a broad area or a big landscape? And then uh, Leopold's five tools, we'll get to learn about him if y'all haven't. Uh, they rammed him into me in college, uh, the father of wildlife management. And then the meat of this presentation will be uh, the prairie. So talking about what species to use, how to, to find seed or use seed. I'm glad to hear the Native American Seed Company is coming soon to talk. I work with those folks a little bit as well. And then the steps for that prairie restoration. And then not to overlook some of the more important parts of a prairie, like legumes, grasses. Uh, those are a big vital part. And it's not everywhere, but I see those lacking in, in some aspects, especially grasses. And then what indicator species, again, you can't see it, but uh, know your soil type, what habitat you're in, what indicator species you might want to include in your, your prairie restoration. All right, so we are in what could be considered the, uh, the oak savanna belt. And so that kind of tan line, historically at least, covers this narrow edge between the western open plains and the eastern forest and whatever else comes with that. But just kind of keep this in mind that we we are in a prairie area, but the cross timbers, of course, even the post oak savanna, that's it's called savanna for that reason. We do have bits of trees here and there and, and wooded crossings. So um, you know, don't discount the woody aspect of a prairie or what you're trying to look at. So uh, more on that. But uh, with with that in Texas, I kind of circled our area somewhat, but that that savanna belt goes down even to the South Texas Plains. But you know we're here in the Cross Timbers, what you can call the Grand Prairie as part of that Fort Worth Prairie. To the east, you have Blackland Prairie, and of course the Post Oak and that green on the eastern side. Uh, there's a lot of differences between those, but a lot of similarities as well. So we'll kind of jump into some of the those things in a minute. And of course, kind of with understanding where you're at and knowing what you might want to do with the a restoration is. You know, what lands, what kind of rainfall zone are you in? Are we in a drought period? Which I think now the weather is just, you never know what it's going to be next month or next year. We're in such a weird pattern. But, and just know that bison, you know, grazing, so cattle, uh, sheep and goats even, you know, uh, fire, all those things were apart, mainly bison, of course. But now we, we don't have as many bison. But, you know, this landscape grew up with fire and grazing. That kind of regime is really important to how our plants evolved and what they need to thrive and, and to be diverse. So, uh, and fortunately, 2011 and 2022, that's when I did this present or a similar presentation. You can see how red that drought index was. I'm glad we're not there. You know, we're we're now here. This is last week. So I'm glad to see most of the eastern two thirds of the state is out of that moderate to, to severe drought. So um, hopefully it's not coming back. So again, what do wildlife need? Food, cover, water, space, and arrangement. Um, all, spec all aspects of land management, whether a yard or a ranch, is to revolve around those components. You know, you need to provide cover, food, water, space, and then arrangement is simply just a combination of, of structure across vertical, horizontal space provided by plants and other features. So, you know, it might be a, a really sharp incline in, in topography. It might be, you know, trees, edge, so going from grass to a forest, et cetera. So the arrangement of, of plants on the landscape. And so kind of jumping into that, uh, just some examples here to, to think about the needs of wildlife and, and how you might want to look at your yard or a restoration and how you manage it. Uh, this is a particular site in Ellis County that was burned in summer of 2020, previously KR, Old World Blue Stem, uh, non-native nasty grass. So they burned it in the summer. There's some research that says that it can set it back and add a lot of diversity, get some native bunch grasses some time to come back. So this was, uh, it was burned in June 2020. This was uh, May of 21, so about a year later. So we're looking at Indian blanket, basket flower, bee balm, a lot of other really good plants, ragweed, croton. It was just a giant pollinator food plot. You know, there was good quail brooding cover. Deer were in here throughout the year following that. But you can see you have that structure of cover. You have, you know, there's not much stats down there. So a lot of our small birds on the ground can move through, reptiles, et cetera. There's plenty of food for pollinators. A lot of these are seed plants that when they seed through the summer and fall, our birds and, and other wildlife can utilize that aspect. 
And then moving on to the summer, you know, I'm, what I'm trying to capture here is that, you know, needs of wildlife change, obviously. You have a change in season. So summer here, this is a similar open prairie landscape. Uh, this property has been restored by fire alone. And so for 10 years, a landowner, or for about 30 years, a landowner grazed this whole property with a little bit higher numbers than he probably should have. But all he did was add fire to a third of it each year. He burned a third or a portion. We call that fast burn grazing. So we probably added 40 plus species of plants just by adding fire to his management program. So just to kind of show you what this looks like, there's big top dahlia, meadow drop seed, scattered pockets of big blue stream meaning grass are coming up and a few trees that he decided to leave at some point along the way. He really didn't like mesquite. So he left a few non-mesquite plants, but you know, here you, you've got, again, there's not much stats down there because it, it has fire at least every three years, something to kind of set it back. There are grazers out here, but just kind of show you some examples of, of structure. You can see a, a, an array of forbs and grasses, kind of woody spread out on that landscape uh, to really kind of captivate or, or you know make a home for all wildlife. So moving on to the fall, again, this looks really thick. We have big blue stem, maximum sunflower. This is a chalky uh, you know, limestone site in Ellis County. Uh, you know, good for, for a lot of different wildlife and really tall big blue stem. I haven't seen that kind of production in a while, but hopefully this year will, will be it. But uh, just to kind of show that season or that change. And then again, talking about the woody aspect, the savanna belt we're in, uh, this might look like a cross timber site, western or eastern cross timbers. Uh, I'm not familiar with this landscape as much, but this was taken at Post or at Gus Angling, WMA, Anderson County. So right in the middle of the post oak savanna, with scattered post oaks, sand jack oaks, black jack oaks, and a very diverse understory from 50 plus years of fire. And uh, now they're looking at grazing that place. But just to show you, you've got a, a structural thing there with the understory, the midstory, the canopy of those oaks, painted bunnings, cardinals, quail might utilize that, turkeys. So kind of an array of the different types of wildlife that like that different structure. And of course, a, a wooded drainage. This is in Freestone County. Some Indian grass growing along a right of way up to the banks of this, uh, this drainage. But you need some thicker areas too, you know, whether it's a wooded patch in the back of your lot or property. You know, uh, it's good to maintain those as sanctuaries, real thick habitats that uh, animals can use for thermal cover in the winter, you know, and, and pollinators as well. Uh, you know, deer habitat, if that's a thing for you. Good. So let's relate these concepts to plants. So, you know, plants obviously provide the mass majority of these needs. Uh, but how do they fit in? What do plants need? Hopefully a lot of folks here, I'm assuming you all probably have a lot more info than I do about growing plants or knowing about plants. I'm just getting into it. but. Uh, but just to kind of talk about, you know, in general from a broad view. Uh, so again, they need food, they need space, they need arrangement. Some plant, you know, some plants need more water than other, others. Some plants need shade or not, uh, but it's definitely more complicated. And that disclaimer is that I'm not a mycologist, a botanist, or a soil scientist. I aspire to learn all those fields, but uh, just a wildlife biologist here. But I just kind of let you know if I say something and it's probably wrong, you know, just don't hold me to it. So, uh, so again, where do plants grow? Usually in the ground, right, in the soil. Not always, some plants grow in trees. I know in South Texas, we had cactus up in the mesquite trees quite a bit. A lot of plants grow out of the rock around here, but uh, in my landscape, a lot of what we have is this good black gumbo. Yannick black clay, Houston black is, is the state soil of Texas, if you didn't know, uh, but a very deep, heavy clay soil. It dominates a lot of the black on prairie. It's good and it's bad. You can see those cracks there. You have that soil swell, or uh, swell, and I'm sorry, my words are jumbled. Uh, but my house is having this issue. You, know, you have foundation issues from that shrink swell uh, component of heavy clay soils. But again, what is a soil? So the largest soil particles are sand, and uh, intermediate is silt, and then clay are the smallest particles. And kind of in general, sands are porous. You have water that sifts right through them usually. Uh, lower water holding capacity, and they're usually more on the acidic side. Silt is somewhere in between. And so we can see clay is tight. Usually its drainage is lacking. It'll hold water longer. Uh, the shrink swell component, and usually there's a high organic matter, more alkaline, kind of in the middle or, or leaning the other way. And then silt kind of takes from both. And so for me, when I see a silty clay or a, a gravelly clay loam with some silt, you're going to have a a better soil to work with. Usually it's more it's more better at letting water go when it needs to and holding water when it should in the spring, uh, whereas clay can hold water for a long period of time. And so again, don't have to have all the information down there, but 
Uh, one example where I work a lot in Western Ellis County is this Austin silty clay or a gravelly clay loam, uh, generally six to eight inches of topsoil and then bedrock. Uh, and so very healthy and organic up top. A lot of the plants that are native have adapted to, to live with those eight inches of, of uh, topsoil, but it offers a unique situation, just one example. And just some fun facts about soil. Apparently a spade full of garden soil contains more species of organisms than a rainforest. I don't know if that's true everywhere. That's pretty remarkable. One cup of soil might hold as many more bacteria than people living on Earth. And then uh, earthworms are really important. Uh, they do a lot for us in that upper top portion of the, uh, the top soil. And so we also like to see living things in the soil. So soil is not just dirt. There, it's an active world down there. There's all sorts of things that we'll probably never identify. Our scientists won't over time. We have protozoa, bacteria, fungi, nematodes, arthropods, mammals that, that live through the soil. So all that is a part of that process and, and their decomposition, their, their growth, the carnivory, all the other fun stuff that we have above the ground is going on down there. And so that's an active part that, that we do have to respect and, and recognize when managing a landscape. So, and then with that too, with a lot of those organisms is, is that carbon storage. So there's a big buzzword carbon sequestration now, obviously, you know, pollution and carbon loss has been a big deal. Well, you know, forests, wetlands, grasslands are, are, are kind of on the big topic now to, to hold carbon. So a lot of companies are turning to ranches and uh, large land holdings to, to pay them for that loss or offset it. But in general, you know, plants absorb carbon dioxide, obviously, and produce oxygen for us to breathe. More complicated than that, but there's a whole group of organisms down below in the roots that, that tap into that as well and share it. You know, fungi are a, a big part of that carbon holding capacity. Um, and then just kind of some examples here. You can see how much soil and gigatons generally is held in the soil atmosphere and then plants and animals. So soil is definitely up there. And the top three habitats from a Google search I found, you know, wetlands are the big one. You can see from that previous uh, graphic, uh, forests and then savannas and grasslands. And uh, we'll kind of go into some more stuff with below the ground. So I'm sure y'all seen images like this. I've always find these remarkable. You can see it at six feet, that middle bar, uh, and it's got the, the the big four listed below. Indian grass on the left, big blue, Swiss grass, little blue stem. Uh, and there's some forbs in there too, but it, it, show this to as many people as you can. I think it's important to show them, hey, you can plant stuff that does this, but imagine what it's doing for the soil, how it's kind of making it more soft and creating the habitat for other living things down below the ground, not to mention what utilizes those plants above ground too. And then I found this picture too, cropland on the right, native prairie planting on the left. You can kind of see just that general lack or that, that depth of root structure and then very few roots down below. I think a corn crop or maybe that's a winter wheat rather. Um, I don't know if this guy waters that every day, but might not be a bad bad job in the under the tent uh, tonight. So, but again, you know, with fungi, that's a, a very unique group of organisms that we know very little about. We, we've learned a lot over the last several decades, but uh, it's so hard to look at that that soil, you know, from that level. You know, there's so much going on down there, but 90% uh, of all plants, you know, rely on a mycorrhizal relationships, that mycelium connection, right? So where fungi are sharing resources or taking resources from roots, et cetera, you know, the, the mycelium, that, which is synonymous with roots and plants, is kind of a highway for, for protozoans and bacteria. Uh, it's almost like a nervous system where, you know, the, the vast network of, of mycelium under the ground. But, um, you know, that's a big part of it that what we do with, with management on top can, can benefit or affect that fungal, you know, network as well. So they, they generally like things that are good for the plants because they're, they're all sharing too. So. And if y'all didn't know, you know, one of the largest known organisms, you know, is uh, or oldest, I guess, is a honey fungus in the western part of the country. It's estimated at 2,300 acres. Uh, just that that network is that large under the ground. And so it's pretty remarkable uh, the more we learn about those. So, And then there's plants that kind of have these unique ad adaptations too, kind of like fungi do. And so, you know, we have hemiparasitic plants or, or obviously parasitic plants too, or carnivorous plants, but the Scrophulariaceae, a lot of these were moved to, I think, Plantaginaceae, but you know, things like Blardia, which is a non-native uh, plant that we, we get a lot where I'm, I'm at. And obviously paintbrush too, they steal from the roots of other plants, typically grasses. And so you'll see Indian paintbrush and big open fields a lot of times, but 
they're tapping into things just like fungi are. Uh, Cuscuta, daughter, are y'all familiar with that orange yellow vine that just shows up all of a sudden and usually grows in open habitats, but that's the top right photo. Uh, there's a whole group of them. They're hard to tell without the fruits or the flowers. Um, and usually they kind of do well on wet years too. Uh, but Cuscuta, fun name to say. And then of course our uh, mistletoe that lives in trees. We have these really unique plants, you know, like a lot of the orchids are, you know, uh, either monotropic or, you know, hemiparasitic. Uh, and then the, the ghost plant too, that's, that's really unique. I don't have a picture of that, but uh, things like Sporanthes, ladies' tresses, orchids, and, and others too. So just to kind of show you all adaptations, you know, there's all the unique stuff that we, that plants do and uh, fungi as well and all the good stuff underground. But let's jump into some habitats here, some examples locally. So I always, I've always found and been taught, you know, extreme habitats or conditions create more biodiversity. So whether it's rocky or, a, you know, a sandy habitat or maybe it's a wetland, you know, plants have to kind of get an upper hand to make a living there, right? So you have that natural, that evolution over time for plants to, to adapt and evolve to, to deal with those conditions. So one example is this rocky limestone outcrop that we see a lot around this part of the state. And so this was taken in Ellis County, a very diverse property, a lot of little blue stem going right up to the outcrop. There's Hall's Prickle over here, a lot of other unique plants that pop up along this site that are more endemic to Texas. But when you get out in this rock in July in the middle of the summer, it's, it's pretty dang hot. So imagine being a plant rooted into rock trying to grow. Uh, generally, you see uh, just a, a flurry of new species when you find these types of habitats. So they're really unique. On the other end of it, you've got that deep sand habitat in the post oak savanna or the piney woods. So, you know, you're looking at 80 inches of sand with not much nutrient availability. Water is going right down through that soil typically, and so you get a lot of unique endemic plants and, and unique plants that have, have adapted to that too. Uh, this was a, a field of, of wild onion and, and baptisia, uh, I guess angling uh, last spring. And so, and then pitcher plant bogs that occur in that same deep sand kind of post oak savanna landscape, again, I guess angling. So we have pale pitcher plants, Saracenia, a lot of it that occupies some of the bogs there, a lot of sedges and rushes. Junkus and, and, and Paparaceae plants, and then uh, just a huge diversity booster for that place. Uh, so again, a very extreme habitat. You have a very low nutrient available, you know, in the soil or that uh, in the bog, and so plants have, have learned to be more carnivorous to get their nutrients from eating living things like flies and et cetera through the pitcher plants. There's uh, uh, sundews and other unique plants too. Um, and then wetlands, of course, too, that, you know, flooding during the, the winter time or, you know, when it dries out in the summer, you had this continuous water thing going on. And so this is a managed wetlands for waterfowl in, in Freestone County and the WMA that I office at. But uh, this plant community changes every year. It's usually high annuals, but you get a diversity of sedges and grasses and, and other things that kind of jump in, too. But, and then uh, so unique habitats create that kind of running into to woodies. So. Uh, definitely appreciate woody plants. Prairies are more open, are more dominated by grasses, but for wildlife, we have to have some woodies if they're managed right on the, the landscape. So uh, this is a property that we're doing some work on in Nevada County. Um, a lot of mesquite over the years, he's hoping to burn this property to, to set back some of the mesquite trees. But ideally you wanna leave some for, for quail and other wildlife to utilize if that's in your area, grassland birds, treble birds, et cetera. So, and then everybody's favorite woody, I don't know if y'all like honey locusts or not. When I work with landowners, I probably shouldn't do this, but I say, hey, honey locusts can be a good plant. Most ranchers look at me and they're either going to walk away or throwing something at me. But, you know, it definitely can take over. But a lot of folks are just, if you mow it, it'll create 20 new plants. It's got those, those underground tillers going on. If you if you pull a plant, you'll just see those years of, of you know, of growth that it, it grew up from in response to that mowing or that you know, fire as well. Uh, but to me, in the Blackland Prairie, at least, there's not a lot of woodies that do grow. You have elm, mesquite, hatberry, bromelia, and then honey locust. So, but for structure, for grassland birds, and then seeds, that, that protein content for deer browse, uh, leave a few locusts out there. I like it. But you've got to maintain it. Don't make it mad. Don't disturb your property too much. Just mow on the edge. And if you use herbicides or not, you know, that's one component too. But, you know, honey locust is one that's a... Uh, good for that particular clay type habitat. So 
And then, of course, legumes, forbs, and brush. Uh, Y'all know Tim Sigmund, or are you familiar with Tim? He's our private lunch program leader. He used to work in our district. Uh, me and him have been on some properties recently, and, and we just got to talking about stuff. And it, it seems like every high-quality remnant prairie or diverse site, the legumes are just through the roof. You know, there's there's a lot of different, and to me, that's a really, it's, there's a reason for it, but, um, you know, it's important to, to think about adding legumes to your mix. And so things like uh, Illinois bundle flour, which is available commercially by seed, uh, Amorpha or lead plant, there's a few different species up here, uh, Tephrosia, goat's rue, this was taken probably at Gus Angling, Partridge pea usually grows in sandy soils, but I've seen it in others. And then of course, dahl dahlias or prairie clovers, and uh, I'm not sure what this guy is. Maybe y'all can help. Uh, I did steal this from Tim, so I'll have to give him a call. That might be or big or big or big or, or, well, what you got? Jeff's got it. There you go. Okay. So, and, and the reason for that obviously is you know legumes have you know this unique relationship with rhizobia or you know bacteria that you know, that, that they, uh, the bacteria utilize resources from the legumes and they create nitrogen. They make that nitrogen in the atmosphere more usable for plants. And so you had this symbiosis going on underground. And then a lot of times that bacteria and that legume relationship is naturally fertilizing the ground for us, right? So I tell landowners a lot that, you know, that add fertilizers and stuff, you know, organic fertilizers, which are definitely not good. And the price of them just does not make it worthwhile. Whether you're doing a hay field or a cropland, you know, plant a cover crop or do legumes, you know, add some legumes to it, get that natural native nitrogen fertilization or uh, nitrogen fixation going on. And uh, it's definitely a big thing around parts of the world for, for adding legumes in the wintertime to crop land to not always leave bare ground out there for a long period of time. That's a huge amount of carbon loss and other things too that come with it. Uh, so just an example of, of uh, that nitrogen fixation process, it's, it's algae, it's Cyanobacteria, it's it's normal bacteria like rhizobia. There's a whole list of different organisms that, that take part in that nitrogen fixation process. So I don't know if that made any sense or not, just kind of bringing up some unique points and, and some some concepts. But uh yeah, we want we want a prairie, right? So we want a healthy soil, biodiversity above the ground and below, carbon holding capacity, water infiltration. So when it rains a lot, I don't want that water to just float off my place. I want to capture it and utilize it, slowly let it go. I want a diverse suite of native plant species, maybe a few trees or shrubs if you're into that thing and you like to have that in your prairie. But how do we get there and how do we keep it? So I'll kind of jump into these again a little bit more. We talked about structure of some, so I'll, I'll skim over those, but scale is important and so is disturbance. So. And for diversity, just so you know, just some, some definitions, the number of different species in an identified area and their relative abundance. And so with diversity, you know, there's a human component to that. There's opinion. Uh, I brought up the trees, right? So a lot of folks want a wide open prairie. You know, generally a prairie or grassland is, is dominated by herbaceous plants, typically grasses and forbs. Uh, but with that savanna complex we're in, over time, I really do believe in some of the research that at times, there was probably more woodies in this landscape than we thought. You might have had a lull in wildfires over 30, 40 years. Well, how, how long does it take for a locust patch to get that tall or mesquite 30 or 40 years? So I think at times we had this pendulum of shrubland to grassland and a lot of the cross timbers, post oak savanna, you know, black prairie, depending on where you're at. But uh, just beyond that, it, it's good for wildlife management. You know, quail, deer, if you're trying to benefit all wildlife, you got to have a few out there and shrubs uh, as well. But uh, again, the diversity of structure. So if you do have a savanna or a woodland, you know, benefit all those levels, whether it's the understory, midstory, overstory, or your pasture. But just some examples of diversity. Again, Gus England, there's been over a thousand species described, a little over 10,000 acres. Um, Singhurst, uh, our state botanist, Jason, I work with him quite a bit. He put out one of the initial floras for out there. It was 970, but it's got to be more now. I'm not sure if they're going to update it. And just some properties I work with, unnamed, one in Ellis County, we're about to break 400 species on 3,300 3, acres. That's mainly all Austin Chalk and Rocky. Uh, to me, that's pretty diverse for a Blackland Prairie property. You know, you've got the out outcrops and the repairing areas, prairie, uplands. And then another small ranch in, in Avera County, about 110 acres, we found 230 species and climbing on a really unique sandy loam soil. So 
Uh, I'm not saying you can get that in your one acre backyard, or 10 acre ranch yet, but uh, just some examples of diversity. So does this look like good structure for wildlife? So this is Texas winter grass. It's a native, a cool season. It's a good plant to have, but it thrives with disturbance. And so as a cool season, if, if the site is grazed too much or mowed too much and then left alone that fall and spring, especially if you get a lot of fall rainfall, Texas winter, winter grass will dominate. So these last two springs, I've seen a lot of winter grass just naturally come up all over, uh, but that's really thick. It needs some setback. It needs something to make it more productive. Does that look like good structure for wildlife? So all these are good. They, they benefit different things, but you know, we're in a savanna landscape here. This is switchgrass, probably some Indian grass down in, in a little wet soil. If you look behind there, you can't really tell, but it's more of an open cruise through those post oaks. Uh, and then lastly, I didn't have one more picture there. So just kind of showing you different structure types. You know, we got to do something with with wildlife to set it back, you know, to, to maintain it. So that's kind of where I'm getting at. And so the guy I mentioned earlier out of Leopold, have you heard of him? Anybody familiar with out of Leopold? So again, the father of wildlife management, um, I was required to read that on day one of college, range and wildlife management. And then he had the first textbook on wildlife, but he brought up this concept of the axe, cow, plow, fire, and gun. So that's kind of the golden bullet for wildlife managers for us in, in Texas Parks and Wildlife. And so all these do different things, but he had some really good quotes that, that I utilize over time. But in general, game or wildlife can be restored by the creative use of the same tools which heretofore destroyed it, the axe, cow, plow, fire, and gun. So whether it's a prairie that was plowed up, uh, deer that were shot, shot off, and then the, you know, the wolves were taken away as the main predator, you know, or just the bison taken away from the Great Plains. Um, you can destroy wildlife population, and that's obviously what has happened over the last few hundred years in a lot of our, our area, but you can restore them with those tools. So we always use that. So with plant communities, there's this thing called succession. It's just the change in plant communities over time. So you start out with annuals, move up to perennial grasses, shrubs. Eventually, it might become a, an oak savanna, and then a hardwood forest or a pine forest, depending on where you're at. Just some photo examples. This is a field about to be planted in the native prairie, but they sprayed it the previous year. It was mainly bare ground, so you got a cool season patch coming up that, that spring. So bare ground from day one. Uh, about a year or two, you'll get annuals and, and weeds. A lot of folks call them. I like the word for, of course. And then you get more perennial grasses eventually, and then you get some shrubs. You might get some plum and, and locust, elm, different things growing up through your prairie. And then really woody, and then eventually you're in a closed canopy forest, you know, et cetera. But I don't always work perfectly like that, but that's just kind of generally, if you don't do anything, what could happen in our part of the world. Uh, I'll kind of jump forward. Well, let's go back. So brush management is one of those. So the ax in that situation. So this is an example where the landowner got a skid steer or, you know, some equipment and set back woodies. And uh, this just shows an aerial image. So it was really thick with locusts and mesquite. And they created these moths. Moths is the group of trees or shrubs uh, for, for grass and bird habitat. There's some deer in that area as well. Uh, just kind of show you what it looks like afterwards. Really thick, dense, mainly broomweed, ragweed, snow on the prairie. Some good natives, but more disturbance or annual type plant. And then, you know, we started growing some silver blue stem and even little blue stem by mesquite, even a year after doing that work. So brush management, the axe tool is one example. Fire, my favorite tool. Uh, so this is back to that patch burn project I had mentioned where the landowner burns a third of the year. This is the last year we burned and it was probably the, more, the most fuel uh, of that nine year study and it burned really well. That was in 22, we caused a burn ban. So I, we were burning in Western Rivera County and I had people calling on the east side of the county that saw our smoke plume go up and had a really high ceiling in the atmosphere that day. And we, we, we burned a lot of that, that prairie country, but I had folks calling me, you know, 40 miles away. Hey, are y'all burning over there? What are y'all doing? The next day, the burn man comes on. It was right before that 2022 flash drought that came in, but it might not have been because of us, but it was just starting to get dry, but there was still soil moisture. But fire is a fantastic tool. You know, plants in, in our landscape, you know, they're, they're adapted to it. Most of the central U.S. and Great Plains, a lot of the country as well, there's different regimes, but you know, it's good for setting back brush, adding diversity, grass growth, and, and forbs are invigorated by it. It kind of adds natural fertilizer to the ground. Uh, it's a really unique tool if it's done right and safely, of course. And again, I'm not asking you to burn your backyard, but, you know, fire is an awesome tool if it can be done. That's number one if you can get to it. 
Uh, this is an example on that uh, that example where you had 400 species or so of plants in Ellis County, more rocky country. We burn in February, mainly a remnant prairie type pasture. And then that was the fall in July. That was last July. So, you know, we got daily multiflora. Big blue stem was blooming in July, early July, last summer. The only part of the whole ranch where it had big blue. And the landowner burned it that previous uh, winter. So uh, fire can bring a lot of our grasses up early and get things going quicker, more seeding and more grass growth potential in the spring. Uh, really diverse site that still looks pretty good to this day. And, and again, just scale, you know, what do you have? If you do have a ranch for a property or an area, just maintain, you make, make sure you have a, a mosaic of woody habitat, more open habitat. Maintain your repairing areas. Don't just take out a creek bank, leave that buffer avoided, you know, woodies and brush along a creek or a drainage uh, to prevent erosion control and add that, that wildlife or that habitat benefit. But, uh, but I'll just pick on Tim. He obviously is not here, but, you know, this is his yard prairie lives down in, in kind of college station area, but, uh, you know, again, scale could be your yard, but maximizing that yard to create usable space for pollinators, birds, et cetera, people that might want to just stumble into your yard to, to do I, or seek and try to figure out what's growing in your little prairie, if you do allow that. And then again, you know, I saw it at Brit over there. I think last time I was at, at Brit or drove through here, they hadn't done that roof project. Uh, maybe it's brand new, but uh, I think this was somewhere in Chicago, just a, a big warehouse facility that had a rooftop prairie that was pretty unique. And I don't think they burn on that rooftop, but um, maybe it's a roof of your local business or your house that you want to plant a prairie on. But uh, again, scale, maximize wildlife benefit, the diversity of our plant species you can have on that, that landscape. That's really big. I saw this too. Um, and I think this was, y'all might've seen some of this, but uh this person right here is a burn boss in an urban urban area somewhere, I think maybe Kansas, I believe. And I want to say it says Lawrence, Kansas Times. So but she does urban or small uh, miniature burns in the city. And so this is just, you know, somebody's yard that, that they were helping to burn. Probably a very light wind day. Maybe it rained the day before or had a drizzle that morning. Uh, I don't know what the neighbors thought of it or what the city thought of it or how much prep and, and planning came with that and Facebook. Uh, announcements, but, uh, you know, it can be done. We, we've got a big presence in Houston with the urban burning. You know, Fort Worth is, is big uh, in doing fire and training for their department, you know, Fort Worth Nature Center and, and other parts of the city as well. Uh, this is something I threw out there, just kind of capturing those tools, um, you know, and, and talking about bob -like quail as being the focal bird for managing all wildlife. You know, they like a little bit of everything, just patchy, weedy areas for, for bugs and pollinators you know, to utilize or seed producing plants. They need bunch grasses for nesting. You know, they need scattered woody cover. Uh, they need a little bit of everything in a very small area across the landscape. But anyways, kind of show you what that means for quail. So you have these brooding or bugging areas. You've got bunch grasses for nesting, scattered cedars and other woody browse or woody species. Uh, that mosaic or connections. So you want to make sure good habitat can be connected uh, for wildlife populations. Uh, but just kind of a, just show you all the, the axe cow plow, cow fire gun again. So just some resources. I can send this to you all if you'd like. So how is this small scale, right? So maybe the axe is the lopper in your backyard to cut back some green briar or other brush that's coming in. The yard goat, the yard cow, tie a cow or a goat to the tree, maybe. I don't get some native uh, fertilizer, natural manure out there and, and allow that, that animal to graze a little bit seasonally. Uh, or it's the shovel or tiller if you're starting from the ground up, you know, to do your own little native restoration in the yard. And again, fire. Maybe you got a pyro neighbor. Put that person to action. Be safe with it, though. Make sure they know what they're doing. Uh, but, you know, maybe maybe you can burn it. If not, you know, graze it, mow it, or disc it. Again, this might be in a yard or on a, land, on a ranch or a park, et cetera. But that's kind of generally what we recommend landowners, you know. You've got to do something to keep it productive. Disturbance is really important for our plants. And so you don't have to burn it all at once every year or all of it, mow all of it. You've got to do portions of it, keep it patchy, you know, portion. You've got to do something, whether it's grazing, mowing, burning, to kind of allow things to reset and keep that competition thing going with plants. And then the gun, I always throw this in there because for one, I would not be here without hunting and, and, and conservation and uh, the Pittman Rover snacks, so the majority of, of ammunition, gun, hunting license, even boat sales all goes back to fisheries and wildlife management. And so uh, I always tell folks, even if you don't hunt or believe in that kind of stuff, buy a hunting license. It helps fund 
a lot of these programs that help landowners do good work and helps me to come speak to you today too. So, or maybe it's the, the BB gun you need to take care of that pesky rabbit in the garden or the backyard. Anyways, there's, these are the tools for, for wildlife. So, uh, and of course we use population management too to, to maintain deer numbers uh, to, to kind of keep wildlife populations in check where needed and at a conservative level. So again, going back to succession, it's all about disturbance. That might be a hurricane, fortunately not an earthquake, which we've been hearing about lately, uh, flooding, a hurt, you know, a, a big fire, a wildfire, a small fire. But, you know, over time, plant communities kind of did this thing. I think it was this big pendulum, and that might be over thousands of years, but we definitely had some changes like this within a century, you know, several centuries over time, just depending on if the fire got to it or if it was too wet to burn, et cetera. But wildlife management, habitat management is disturbance management. And again, that can be a backyard or a 10,000 acre ranch. So, all right, so let's do some fun stuff. You know, you want a prairie or to make your prairie better. So we'll talk about just prairie restoration and what I've seen that has worked and hasn't uh, starting from ground zero. But generally on any, any particular place, know your soils. You know, know what you have, what can and can't grow there. Know what kind of issues you're gonna have on your soils. Know where the shading's at, the layout of your yard. Figure out where you might want different parts of your prairie to be. Uh, if you are going to plant different, you know, sections of that, maybe you have a grassy area here, a more wildflower based area here, but take your time planting that, you know, formulate a good seed mix. If you are going to plant in or broadcast, uh, and don't avoid those non chilly plants. Some of my favorite plants for wildlife are wind pollinators or just, you know, there's no value aesthetically looking at them. Things like ragweed, croton, et cetera, that are usually a part of every landscape or every property on that. Uh, it is so, and I'll get into that. I'll get into that a little bit in a minute. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it can be adjusted. This is for a uh, property interested in grazing and managing well. So they're going to rotate cattle three years after they planted. So we'll get into that a little bit. And then of course, know what invasives you have on your property, whether it's a lovely privet or I've got those later. We'll jump into it. But so check the present vegetation and the invasives you have. Know your rainfall zone. Know what ecological site you are. If you're not familiar with that term, we'll go into it a little bit. Figure out kind of what seed mix you want or what species you want to add if you are going to bring in plants. Uh, the restoration process, and I was going to do PPM, but it didn't sound good. So the three P's of prairie restoration, planning, prep, preservation. I like to say maintenance over preservation, but good. So know what rainfall you're zone in. So generally we're in kind of a 35 to 45. I think we can throw that out the door the last two or three years. It's just either too wet or too dry. I'm not sure, but know generally what rainfall zone you're in and, and if you are going to burn or do different disturbances this kind of tells you here this is a map showing what we think was historical fire intervals across the country you know over the last several hundred years you know from or a thousand years rather from fire you know rings and, and oak trees and different trees etc but you know we're kind of in this every two to four year zone here if you jump out uh, to the southeast you know that might be every two years especially in the piney woods and as you get more rocky, drier country, um, you know, it's a little bit less, but you know, we are in a two to four year range here. So uh, good. So ecological sites, have you all heard of that term? NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, kind of has this big system uh, that, that utilizes that and the Web Soil Survey as well. But this is just a, one particular zone or ecological site, Texas North Central Prairies up here, but I'll jump into something locally for me. So. In general, the ecological side is just similar, so, similar soils, climate, and, and plants in one area, right? So it, it's going to be pretty homogenous across the board on where they've mapped these ecological sites. And so the example on the right is, is a blackland site. Historically, it was tall grass prairie. If you took fire away for a long time or grazing, it turned into a shrubland. Uh, maybe it was converted to Bermuda grass for cropland. And then those arrows kind of show you what you can do to get back to that historical community. Or if you wanted to just ruin that historic remnant prairie, where to go the other way? It's all kind of mixed in there, but it's what we call state and transition models. So it's that plant succession, that change in plant communities over time, but it's diving into fire and grazing and even saying, hey, you need to really do some thinning or mechanical work to get this forest back to what it should be. But uh, you know, check out the website, Web Soil Survey. You can kind of draw a proper boundary around your area. It'll show your soils and a lot of other data as well. But there's a link to show you ecological sites so you can zoom into your yard 
and kind of figure out what site you were on based on the soils and all that other good stuff. But within those sites, um, again, this is Block One Prairie, kind of shows you T1A, no fire, it turned into a shrubland, et cetera. It's going to show you what, you know, just generally what the dominant plant species were. You know, so it's saying on the black one site, big blue Indian grass, eastern gamma, switchgrass were the big tall grasses occupied the majority of the bio or the biomass on these sites historically. And then mid grasses like side oats, little blue stem, or tall grasses too, depending on what type of rainfall you're in. But there's grasses, forbs, trees, shrubs mentioned on these that they've kind of developed um, for all these ecological sites. So it'll tell you maybe what kind of seed makes you want to start with. And then the web soil survey again is just websoilsurvey.com. Type it into Google, uh, start it, draw your property boundary, and a list of soil types, what percentage on your property is each. You can jump into soil details. Um, I like soils, so I get on here a lot to kind of scan around and look at stuff. Uh, this was Midlothian, I think. So this is a native a natural park over in, in Ellis County. But in general, in this area, at least where I'm at, you know, here and more east, you've got these gravelly soils that are really thin, silty clay loam or Austin silty clay kind of along our creeks on this uh, Austin chalk or Balcones type of landscape. So you might be at 29 inches deep on a, on a relic site down up against a creek, but up on the hilltops, these chalky ridges, six, eight inches sometimes of soil. Houston black again is just clay forever. And then Crockett soils, which are similar to a lot of the cross timbers, these fine sandy loams. You've got a few inches of sand to so 10 inches of sand up top and then a clay pan down below. So those can be droughtier, those can be unique on how the roots penetrate that layer. But if you have crockett soils or clay pan type soils, you know, that can offer a unique type of situation if you're gonna do a restoration. And again, just a deeper sand area or a sandy loam. It's an example of the post oak savanna. But so what do you want your site to look like? Do you want an outcrop in your backyard? backyard? Maybe you live on one, I don't know, but you know, just know what you have, know what there are some bare areas or rocky areas and utilize what you have on your property. This is just up the hill the next spring from that picture, the Chalky Ridge Ecological Site, this Austin chalk formation that goes through Dallas, Western Ellis County, Eastern Hill County. You know, I know several folks like Jeff here have been on these, these particular areas like this, but this was all in the same May. I was doing a, a spring fall survey. This was one pasture, it was all white. This pasture was basically all red from Indian blanket. So this is all Prairie Bishop by Flora Americana. And then uh, this was green, green, uh, green thread, Thelosperma, Philiform, uh, something right here. So green thread, all yellow. So we got, you know, mayonnaise, ketchup, mustard. And then the next pasture I went to was all of them, just a hodgepodge of all those. So just to kind of show you that I use plants and I've learned this from landowners as indicators. If you get, for one, this limestone country is diverse for forbs, like the hill country is on a good wet year. But if you get all white, you know, or all red one year, there's something going on there. There might've been too much grazing at that side, or maybe that person mowed there last year. Maybe you, know, you got a lot of rain and it brought it up. But generally, plants tell you a story. So Landon and I work with always told me that too many of one plant, like if you have a monoculture or just a, a ragweed or croton or something that comes up, it's just a symptom. It tells you something happened historically or the previous year, Something's going on, just take your time, figure out why it came up and then adjust next time. So use plants to kind of tell you if you are, if you do have a prairie, you know, what might need to happen. Maybe it's time to burn, maybe it's time to, to do something different. Uh, but good, so plan the prairie out, identify where you're gonna have it, kind of location, all that good stuff we talked about. Funding, maybe there's some local grants or, or Texas Parks and Wildlife funding that could help with that. We do have a native seeding program called Pastures for Helping Birds. It's 20 acres minimum, but you can combine acreage of other areas to, to do it. We provide herbicide or the means to get rid of what's there, all the non-native exotic grasses, if that's the dominated in the area. And then we'll help provide the seed to, to reseed that into a prairie. Uh, but think about the timeline, you know, how long is it gonna take to get a prairie there, you know, management wise? Is it days, weeks, months, years? Strap your seed bolt in and hold on, you know, for years, prairie management does not end after you seed it. And then implementation, you know, do you have the equipment to do it? Uh, are you going to use herbicide or not? Solarization, do you have manpower to help you if you can't do it yourself? Identify the species, so what non natives you might have. You don't have to know where they're from, but we got them all here in Texas. We got several bad ones. Has the site had fertilizers recently? You know, nitrogen fertilizers or inorganic? Uh, has there been grazing on the site, other disturbance? Is it a new build or a new lot? Uh, did they bring in? 
you know, bad building soil. So know your invasives. I'm sure you all know a lot of these, but Bermuda grass uh, is pretty common in most of Texas, you know, uh, coastal or common Bermuda grass. That's the number one, one plant that when we're doing a pub project or a restoration that we're trying to get rid of. And uh, bahia grass is another one in more sandier topsoils. I don't know how much bahia comes into the cross timbers, but we get a lot of that in kind of the post oak savanna and more sandier, wetter climates, piney woods. Uh, it's a paspalum, as you can tell, but generally you just have two uh, seed heads that come up forked. Uh, other bad ones, I call Johnson grass uh, the cockroach of the plant world. When everything else goes away, all the other plants, for whatever reason, the world ends, hopefully it never does. Johnson grass is going to be waving a flag saying, hey, I'm still here. You just can't get rid of it. It's it's uh, the property, one of the pictures back that we showed you, the landowner was doing a pub or a restoration project, and, and he sprayed. It was all Bermuda grass, a little bit of KR blue stem. He never saw Johnson grass at all, and he sprayed everything early summer to try to prepare the ground for that planting. And uh, he had Johnson grass pop up everywhere. He's never seen it in 20 years of owning the property on that pasture. So it was milkweed that came up because milkweed doesn't care about herbicide, at least the ones that we have here, and then Johnson grass. And uh, so anyways, that's a bad one. KR blue stem is about everywhere these days. Uh, I can live with that more because it does have some wildlife value. I don't like not natives at all, but or non natives at all, but you're never gonna get rid of all of them. So I always help landowners that have a bad KR problem, try to change their management up, do some summer fire, do some grazing, different things to kind of allow diversity to grow through that KR blue stem. But it's a tough one that usually when they do spray, it just makes it mad. It grows twice as much twice as high. It's usually two or three applications to get there. Um, and then pine grass is another one that doesn't really spread a whole lot, Panicum coloratum. It uh, it shows up in pastures and sometimes yards too, but it's it doesn't spread as much, it seems like, as the other non-natives that we have. These are all things to consider and look for. And then all the yard weeds, you know, field matter, chickweed, uh, that's a native, the uh, uh, aster divaricatum, crabgrass is an issue. And then, of course, our lovely woodies, you know, privet, tree of heaven, and Dino, all the other nasty stuff that we always see every time you get close to a city or an urban area. Uh, so recognize what you have if you need to get rid of that stuff. If they made a seed bank, those non-natives have seeds that have built up in your soil for years, that's going to affect how your prairie does over time, what kind of management you need to do to, to keep those out in the future after you, you plant something. So, again, kind of have your desired outcome. We're going to get into that grass for uh, component here. So in general, I always recommend 60 to 40. So that's PLS, pure live seed, uh, you know, 60% roughly of grass to 40% forbs. If it's a grazing type landowner or, you know, production, they might go up to 65 or 70. If it's pure wildlife, 50-50 or, you know, 50-40, I'm sorry, 40-50 uh, uh, the other way around. But grass is, you know, really important to kind of get into that mix. So Native warm, season gra native warm season grasses offer cover, food, all that good stuff. They're really good for roads control. They're perennials, they're drought hardy. And uh, there's our, there are warm season and cool season, you know, versions like, you know, uh, Canada wild rye, Virginia wild rye that are available by seed. But, you know, all the big four too, and then forbs. And so we all know forbs are great for wildlife, but generally when you're doing a prairie restoration, with wildlife in mind or even pollinators, cover is usually the more limiting factor on that site uh, than food. And so if you had enough forage species and some of those annual grasses, you'll have plenty of, of food for birds and, and pollinators, et cetera. But having the right cover and structure comes with the grasses usually, because they're going to be there standing more often than the forbs are, because they generally die back and go down. But we'll show you all some examples soon. And again, have your goals down. Is it wildlife habitat, just pollinator habitat? Is it forage for, for cattle or other livestock? You want all three on your property? Think about that before you do it. Um, and again, grasses kind of can play into all these. And my goal for most landowners, and I tell folks, maximize plant and structural diversity for wildlife benefit, potential grazing if they want to graze it now or later, landscape health. So get as many species thrown in there as you can. Don't get the ones that really take over in your yard, like bee bomb and stuff. Maybe add a few seeds here and there for some of those or just have a plan to control those really aggressive natives too, uh, but have a good diverse mix. And again, you know, starting from scratch, do you need to use herbicides or are you against it and want to? There's ways to work around it. You know, you can use solarization or hand pulling. Um, 
you know, generally, if we're going to use selective herbicides, there are things that only control Johnson grass or really only control the hay grass. Generally, some forbs take a hit, but they come back pretty quick. Uh, that's going to be outrider plateau that are really good on Johnson grass and, and, and sorghums. Cimarron Plus or Escort is good for Bahia. It's granular. It's really small. Um, and then, of course, general herbicides like Roundup, glyphosate. Um, and I mentioned these because, you know, they are, there's all, always a lot of debate on herbicides, just chemicals. And I don't like anything like that. I don't like non, you know, fertilizers or any herbicides. But for a big scale, if you're going to do 100 acre, 200 acre restoration, it's impossible to get where you want to go without using some herbicides. And I always tell landowners that, that ask about it. Follow the label to a T, you know, follow the, the guidelines, get up early in the morning with no wind, wear clothing and gloves and all that good stuff. Uh, follow that that label and then don't get up in a helicopter or pay somebody to airily spray because that almost always ends up with a neighbor's trees and, and pasture getting partially killed. Uh, but it's something to think about. You know, herbicides are very useful and uh, they can be expensive. But if you have a bad non-native, you've got to really do something to get rid of that for a year. And again, if you have prepared ground, is it dirt, is it thatch? Do you need to use a no-till type system to plant it or broadcast? Uh, or maybe you just want to bring in your, you know, cap capture local species on roadsides or from your local, your neighbors, or, you know, you have a remnant prairie somewhere you're going to collect from. Somebody's donated or brought you seeds, so, you know, or living plants too. So, I mean, maybe you're going to do that. It might take more time to do so. But if you have the money or even funding or cost share, you know, seed dealers are several in Texas. Uh, there's a good list of species that you can purchase to utilize, and many of those are site-specific or general. It just depends. And then uh, greater diversity, but it is greater cost. Obviously, the more species you add, the more money it can go up. But um, if you are going to do, you know, a drill, so just so y'all do know, Parks and Wildlife does have a large tractor pull Truex no-till seed drill. We have a mini uh, four-foot drop seeder. It's a Truex as well, but we pull it behind an ATV or a vehicle. So we do have seed drills that can be used for small acreage if y'all do need one for a park or garden or backyard. You know, free of charge, we just want to make sure you're not planting Bermuda grass or, or non, you know, bad stuff too. So there's a funny story in Mesquite several years ago, a guy borrowed one. We didn't hear from him for a year and a half. He had the seed and showed it to me. And anyways, we finally called him and then he didn't answer his phone forever. The game wardens got involved. And apparently this guy had stolen equipment on his property, you know, and whatever. He apparently been stealing stuff and scamming people to get equipment out on this property and sell them on eBay. But anyways, again, we're finally went out there when the gate was open one day and just brought it back to us. But, uh, but this guy has apparently been just kind of moving around doing that. But anyways, that's a bit, you know, just random story there, but we do have seed drills and we do have programs to help recommendations to, to utilize seed mixes. Uh, but there's just some examples. If you're going to no-till, have a light layer of thatch on the ground, a little bit of bare ground is okay. Most of our natives don't need much depth. You know, we're looking at an eighth of an inch sometimes, maybe an inch deep for salmon grass, eastern salmon grass, but a, a very shallow um, placement of that seed. Uh, just some examples there. I'll, I'm glad to share these pre this presentation for some of these details if you'd like. There's more info to share. But the good thing about where we're at now with NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, Caesar Clayberg, their native seeds program. There's a whole bunch of varieties. This is a plant material center in Nacogdoches. Almost every region in Texas has a plant material center now where they're, they're studying what, what variety is needed and best for these soils and this climate, this part of Texas. And so this, you know, this is a Liatris pycnostachia, you know, uh, prairie gay feather. We've got some switchgrass here, probably some bluestem over here. But anyways, there's a whole bunch of varieties out there. So make sure you know what varieties there are and what's best for your soils and your property. We've done a lot of pro-restorations, you know, with some of these different varieties and some work better than others. So reach out to us if you need help or, or an expert. Uh, and just to let you know, too, there is, uh, so there's OK Select, Cimarron, and now Coastal Plains Little Blue Stem. Those are usually more common and available through Native American seed and Bamert seed. Coastal Plains is the new one that they adapted, I think, in Katy at their seed center. Um, I was out there in May three or four years ago when they were first getting started. Cimarron, which is what we've always used, it does horrible. I never see little blue stem come up until we started using these different ones. Cimarron in May was this tall, and I think OK Select was this tall, and then Coastal Plains was blooming in May already. Um, so it was a very... Is that better for people who sure. Are sure, yeah. So, I mean, it was 
Cimarron was maybe three inches tall, and then OK Select was probably five or six inches tall, and Coastal Plains was several feet tall and already blooming in May. And so uh, very highly adapted. It didn't really take over the site, but it, it did pretty well. So there's, there's a lot of good varieties out there that folks might not be aware of. All right, so examples. Hopefully the rest of this is pictures and less looking at words and hearing me ramble about stuff. Let's get into the, the prairie species, what we might add to it. So everybody knows big blue stem, turkey foot. Uh, this is one of my favorites. We were talking earlier how I think it really needs that, that early summer rain to, to seed well in the fall. And so I don't see it unless it's a, a wet early summer, wet spring. Um, if it doesn't rain that time of year, it just pits on root depth and more, more basal growth too. But these were all taken this year, um, May, June. So that's when I first started seeing big blue bloom this year. It, it can come up pretty early. Uh, and that's a lot of what I see it kind of in that limestone country, just a really tight base of, of or a bunch of grass. And so big blue stem patches, this is all kind of one plant that's slowly starting to spread, you know, in those rhizomes or, or tillers under the ground. So big blue stem, little blue stem, uh, obviously another good one, one of the dominant in the post oak savanna, you know, black plum prairie typically. Uh, it's our main nesting substrate for bobwhite quail. Uh, a lot of good critters like this one. This was after a summer fire. So they burned in October the previous year. This was a month ago. It was about to start flowering in, in June or late June, I guess. But this is a site that needs disturbance. There's nothing but little blue stem. Uh, diverse on the outside of it, kind of on some rocky outcrops, but this is a sandy soil. Little blue stem does really well in sandy country. And so if you have sandy soils, it can dominate depending on management. Indian grass, one of the other good ones that can start blooming pretty early. You know, it's got that nice legal, that gun side or pointed legal that comes up. Golden yellow inflorescence through the fall. Uh, this was taken several weeks ago in Navarro County on the roadside, uh, roadside uh, area of Indian grass. But these are just the, the big four uh, and then switchgrass too. So if you're going to do switchgrass and plant this and your prairie, whether it's small or large, there is a Blackwell variety and there's an Alamo variety. Alamo is a monster. I don't know why. I mean, think of the Alamo as being pretty big back then, probably when it was there. Alamo just, it, it's voracious. It does well in the right soils like these clay pans on a 30, 40, 45 inch rainfall zone. It can really just take off. And it's good for dams, drainages, low wet areas. If you're going to plant it, if you do it, plant very light, you know, on the mix. Uh, but Blackwell is more of our native kind of upland uh, adapted uh, switchgrass. So um, typically it gets about this tall. You know, it's not quite as big as just switchgrass is. Do you just tell the difference between the south and the north? G generally, and, and that's the thing too, where I, most of my work is in the post oak and blackland south and east of Dallas. I very rarely see switchgrass unless it was from a, a seeding or native planting. And I'll see Alamo kind of in, in creeks and drainages. I think the seeds are just kind of making their way down or it's it's arriving there. But if you go up northeast of Dallas, Fort Worth, like Climber Meadow, you've got the Blackwell pretty prevalent with gamma grass. And so, but definitely the size, if I'm on a prairie restoration and I see this six foot tall, five foot wide grass, it's probably gonna be, you know, switchgrass or Alamo switchgrass. And Blackwell is, is more wildlife friendly. But I will say if you have very little woody cover, you know, big property, We've seen quail select for switchgrass. They use it as woody cover because it's so big and dense. And the landowner grazes a few months out of the year occasionally, and then just does well for that particular uh, strategy. So uh, not one of the big four, I like to say big five, but Cytos, Gromus, State Grass of Texas, you can't do a prairie restoration in Texas without having this in there somewhere. It's just, it's a good early starter. This with sprinkle top, which is more of a Western species, we add that to our mix, green sprinkle top, Cytos grama, these will be on the first two years of the project pretty heavily if it goes well. Now, generally, after you burn or mow or graze, you know, it'll come up a little bit each year, uh, but it kind of peters out eventually. But it kind of sets the stage, gets the ground ready, that soil ready for those bigger bunch grasses and forbs to kind of come in and grow in your prairie. Uh, but side oats is one that definitely does grow in, in all these eco regions around here. Meadow drop seed. Um, not one of the big ones, but I see this in, in a lot of sandy or even clay or let's see, clay type habitats. Uh, it can be a, an indicator of increasing disturbance. Too many cows out there, too much mowing, uh, even too much burning, you'll see meadow drop seed increase. And so it's a good native, it's kind of a bunch grass, 
But if you see a lot of that stuff, it'll tell you something's not going too great. You just want a little bit of it kind of spread out on your landscape. One of those indicator species. Yes. I'm not too familiar with Sylvia strop seed. So that kind of upper black prairie is what you're talking about. Um, I haven't seen it in person, so I probably would not be able to help describe it. But I think because there's several varieties or subspecies of Sporobolus compositus here. So um, I know we have tall, which is probably what this guy is, uh, compositus, compositus, but I'm not sure on the other ones. So, but yeah, that's a good question. And so what ecoregion are you in? Are you over here in the cross timbers? Are you in that Blackland Prairie or post oak savanna? There's transitions and, and islands of each, I think, you know, right? So even in the Blackland, we're, Right over here, I've got a little plano that's got some really nice sandy soils, very productive sandy loams. Um, if you get along the transitions, there's clay and then sand and then rocky outcrops. So, you know, figure out what region you're in. And this is just kind of pictures and showing you from what I've just, what I've seen on, on different properties and in my time looking at plants is what the main indicator species are. So maybe consider collecting these as seed or plants or you know, from a from a seed company, if you are going to start a prairie, to include in your mix. But for a black land prairie, so if you're in those clay soils, those clay pan soils, kind of Dallas Southwest to the east, uh, on higher quality sites, I always see big blue stem and Indian grass. For me, southeast and east of Dallas, those are the dominance on remnant prairies. Little blue stem will be in there a little bit, but we had this big blue yellow Indian grass, you know, kind of co-dominated black land prairie. But these are the other ones, Little Blue, Side Oats, Fine Mesquite. Texas Cupgrass is a really neat one that shows up on occasion. Texas Wintergrass, a cool season native there. Uh, Virginia Wild Rye will pop up too. I didn't add that to the list. And then Gamma Grass occasionally, but that's got to be on a roadside or a very well-managed property. It does not do well with, with grazing or too much mowing, so that's why I don't see it a whole lot anymore. And then some of the woodies, you know, Honey Mesquite, Eastern Red Cedar. The increases of those are going to tell you things are going backwards. You, you want to add more gum or hatberries. So you're going to add a few woodies on your clay, deep clay patch or, or property. Gum is a really good wildlife friendly plants. And then hatberry too. Osage orange, a Hercules club. Those are some other good ones that pop up. And then forward wise, I know I'm on a high quality blackland site and I see maxillin sunflower, narrow leaf gay feathers, liatris plantata, lucranata, whichever way you want to go with that. Common milkweed, Asclepias verdiflora, trailing radney, Cremaria lanceolata, and then pitcher sage, Salvia azurea. Uh, when I see those on a, on a clay side, it tells me, hey, something's right here. Landowner's done really well where it's a protected remnant. Uh, I definitely would want those if I was going to do a restoration. And I'll see, we'll see trailing radney a lot at the end of this presentation. It's a good plant that shows up in a lot of soil. So again, Black Lone Prairie, just kind of that gray area there. So you've got a northern component, a southern component. There's transitions in between. Uh, we've got Austin Chalk kind of on that western edge. So a lot of my work is over here on the western edge of Ellis County. That's kind of Grand Prairie type. Uh, just some photo examples. So this is the little remnant corner of a pasture, maximally in sunflower, silver blue stem. There's some Indian grass mixed in. Trailing ratnies is growing all on the base of that. It's a really good spring for it this year uh, for that. And then another example, this is a Houston black soil in the Vero County, just little blue stem, real fuzzy in the background, but this whole pasture was kind of covered in a little blue, Indian blanket, uh, American basket flower, all that good stuff. And then another example, Indian plantain. I see that a lot on really wet years and it, it popped up a lot this year too, but it'll be on a, on a less heavy clay. So you'll have this kind of 40 to 60 inch clay, like a Ferris or Hyden clay. You'll get some of these more rocky loving or, you know, uh, Indian plantain is one of them that pops up more on those sides. Just some close up image of the, the, the flowers of Arnaglossum, Plantagenium, Indian plantain. Uh, really good wildlife friendly species. It does well in a yard too. I've had it pop up in my yard from seed. And then another example, this is back to that patch burn project. We got snow on the prairie or uh, Indian blanket that's gone to seed. There's a whole bunch of Indian grass just popping up in here. Uh, doing really well. Probably some ragweed mixed in there, croton. There's snow on the prairie, zoomed in. Really good wildlife plant for pollinators. The seeds are relished by birds when they fall off finally in the fall and winter. Dove and quail like those. It does have that silky latex sap that's uh, not too fun. But And then kind of some of those indicators too. One really unique one is um, 
You can barely see it, this guy likes to hide, but narrow leaf milkweed, this is Katina Prairie in Ennis, Texas. Um, so it's really hard to find it. You gotta get out there when it's in July and really hot uh, to, to find it. And then pitcher sage too grows a lot there, Katina. But when I, I, that's the only place I've ever seen narrow leaf milkweed, it's called Fiestino Fowler. So if you see it, let me know, I'd like to go find it. If it is a public or an accessible site, uh, but that one's apparently prairies throughout a lot of uh, north central Texas uh, and places. And then Salvia azurea, again, just a good indicator of good habitat. So uh, sandy land, again, I'm not that familiar with the cross timbers, but I am the post oak savanna. In general, split beard blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, purple top tridents are kind of the big indicators there. If you're on a deeper sand or like a blowout or a sand dune type thing, you might just have like, you know, curly three on or some really scraggly grasses mixed in. A lot of those rosette grasses, dicanthelium, show up on those deep sand sites. And then forbs to look out for if you're on any kind of sandy soil or butterfly, world, or green milkweed. Narrow leaf gay feather again is, is on those. Uh, not, or nodding beer tongue, uh, so penstemons, um, thoughts gloves, and then prairie clover. So there's usually several daily as it show up on those high quality sands. It kind of depends where, where you're at and what you might have. And of course, you know, post oak, blackjack oak are dominant, not dominant on cross timbers and post oak. Uh, hopefully you have one of those in your yard rather than a red oak or something if you're on a true cross timber site. Maybe consider planting one if you are going to add a tree. Uh, Mexican plum, sand plum are really good wildlife friendly plants. And then there's a whole list of, of woodies that can be on those, those sandier cross timber sites too. And a big thanks to Jeff for helping provide some of this info because Again, I don't have much experience this far west I-35. So, um, examples. This is mainly on our Parks and Wildlife website, but across timbers, kind of scattered post oak and black jack oaks. So we got a lot of little blue stem, maybe some woodies coming in. Just a, to me, it looks like a good healthy wildlife site. Uh, another example, probably side oats grama with western ragweed mixed in here. I'm not sure what the yellow is. Maybe goldenrod or could be the, the fruits of nightshade, the silver leaf nightshade, honey mesquite, of course, probably some cedar mixed into that area. And then also, this looks a lot like Gus Angling. This was off our website on the cross timber section. So uh, very similar to the, the more post oak example, probably a little bit less rainfall. And then land passes cut plain on that kind of western, southwestern end of the ecological region. I haven't really been out in that landscape a whole lot, but just an example from our website of what that might look like. So. A uh, little bit different landscape, kind of rolling, rolling hills and ridges. And I put this here because if you have pictures of good cross timber sites, your representative, hey, this looks like it should be a good cross timbers, remnant prairie or savanna, send them to me. I need to add them to the presentation. So I didn't have much to work off of there. And then my favorite, the Chalky Ridge or Austin Chalk, kind of that Grand Prairie landscape, that western edge of the Blackland Prairie. And so what I found is little blue. It's definitely going to be a dominant bunch grass on there, but if you start seeing seep muley, which is only on those outcrops, those seeps off those limestone ridges, that's uh, Muhlenbergia, the river shonii, really unique plant. Side oats, grama, Texas grama, hairy grama, so rear little curtipendula, uh, rigaceta, and then a hirsuta. Those really pop up on a lot of those sand, those uh, rockier limestone types too. But uh, you'll get big blue Indian grass on the hillsides and the kind of more wet slopes off those prairie up ones too. And then Forbes, there's a whole bunch of them. Again, this type of soil and this this rocky stuff adds a lot of diversity, but green thread, Bellisperma, Prairie Bishop by Four Americana. We've got at least three common dahlias. You know, the showy, which is daily compacta, round head, dahlia multiflora, which uh, is just about to wrap up flowering right now. And then golden dahlia, dahlia aurea, we're uh, gonna be on those limestone sites. Penstemon cobea, definitely a good prairie plant on clay and clay pans and these rockier sites too. And then a narrow leaf gay feather, again, is always a good indicator of a lot of different habitats in Texas. Missouri primrose and Berlandier sundrop. So Oenothera uh, macrocarpa and then uh, uh, Calilophus or Oenothera Berlandieri, those are really good, uh, good forbs to tell you you're playing limestone. Stiff flax, linum, rigidum. Leavenworth, Syringa, Ringium, Leavenworthii. Uh, those are kind of your indicators. But again, a lot of these can pop up uh, on these limestone sites, depending on how remnant, how healthy the sites might be, if you're on the edge of an outcrop. And of course, woodies, Gumamilia, Deciduous Holly, Elbow Bush, Buckthorn, there's, there's a lot of them. 
a lot of good woodies cover this part of the world. So examples, you know, this is a remnant prairie on chalky limestone. So you've got a lot of the good plants kind of mixed in. Little blue stem dominates a lot of these areas uh, as a native bunch grass. Most of the purple top tridents, big blue Indian grass is going to be along this wetter edge of these drainages, kind of the lower slopes of the pastures. Back to that site that was burned in the in the, the winter, and they we, we saw it in July. So we got side oaks grama growing out here, big blue stem blooming in early July, little blue stem, partridge pea, uh, American basket flower again is popping in there. Uh, probably prairie bluets and other stuff mixed in. Another example, real similar. And then prairie penstemon, penstemon cobe is a really good one, green thread. And then there's prairie basic began. So some of the ones I've talked about that are pretty good and uh, good indicator species for that. So corn herb daisy, tetranos linearifolia, and uh, corn salad, kind of early spring, early, you know, kind of mid to early spring, Larianella radiata, there's a few species. And of course, drum and skull caps, Scutellaria drummondii. Those are some of the fun ones to find on these limestone outcrops and, and sites. And then one of my favorites that's blooming now, kind of June through the summer, is Menzelia oligosperma. Chicken thief, uh, those leaves are like Velcro. They'll just stick on to your pants. And it's hard. The washing machine will not get them off. And so uh, Velcro weed, chicken thief, uh, blazing stars is one of the common names. It's a really unique group of plants. And uh, that's one of the ones that really occupies these, these limestone type prairies. And then we go on to the outcrops. So on the rock itself, these are kind of the big ones that if you see these, you're on a high quality undisturbed outcrop. So some Texas endemics to mention, Hall's prairie clover, Dahlia hollii, white compass plant, Silphium uh, albiflorum, woolly, woolly ironweed, which is uh, Vernonia lenheimeri, and then Jersey tea, uh, not an endemic, but a really good one that likes limestone. There's two endemics that I've seen on some, some areas in, in, the, in Ellis County, Leatris, uh, Glandulosa and Leatrosis valis. So they're kind of split off as their own species several years ago. I see them on these limestone outcrops. Engelman bladder pod, Pyceria engelmania is another endemic that occurs on these. But there's a whole list uh, of other species. Again, trailing ratney. I see that on any high quality site, no matter what the soil. If it's a remnant prairie, it's probably going to have ratney in it, at least in North Texas, even in East Texas, Central Texas too, in some places. So. Uh, limestone outcrops again, just another example. There's that lovely Missouri primrose or flutter mills, one of my favorite plants growing at the base of this uh, outcrop with water flowing through it. Barbara's buttons, Marshallia hespitosa, excuse me, like sandstone and limestone outcrops. Uh, they'll do well on these. You can see all the little blue stem and green thread mixed in. Uh, probably some Jersey tea that has been done flowering already, kind of below it. Trailing ratney. There it is. So one of my favorite plants, such a unique maroon orchid looking flower that uh, if I start seeing that, it's like, okay, what else is here? There's something going on here. It's a healthy remnant diverse site. Uh, and I get that too. Tim has seen the same thing in a lot of his travels. He gets to go all around Texas. I'm kind of only around DFW and South, uh, but he, he'll agree too that it's, it's, a, it's a really good native. And then some of those other endemics, so like the woolly ironweed, uh, Vernonia lenheimeri, Silphium abiflorum, right when it gets real hot, they kind of pop, pop up and flower. Uh, this guy's going off right now. Uh, some of the white compass plants are still blooming, but it's about done. Other fun stuff, uh, ragweed. To me, it's one of the best wildlife plants out there. Western ragweed, Ambrosia, Silostactia. And the reason is they have linked this to high lactation rates in does for fawn survival. It, the, the plant material and seeds are very high in protein. Pollinators, not really so much more of a wind pollinated plant, but it's good for browse. You got that soil thing going on that's been linked to nitrogen fixation with rhizobia underground too. It grows everywhere. It increases when you do bad things. So if you dig into the ground too much, plow too much, or graze too hard, it really explodes. But it's a good plant to have a little bit in your yard if you're willing to take that step. So anyways, Western ragweed is a good one. If you have the allergies and you're worried about it, maybe not so much, but uh, it's a really good native natural plant that pops up in a lot of habitats I've been across. And of course there's Jersey tea here, Ceanopus herbaceous, and then Topeka coneflower, which likes the limestone and sandstone. I've seen that in scattered parts of my counties. Uh, rough rosin, we had a good one there. And then all the dahlias, so there's your species there. The dahlia hollow that I mentioned on the limestone outcrops, a unique Texas endemic. Uh, 
Uh, maybe you can get some seed locally. You can find it and grow them on your rock out crop in your backyard if you have one. Big Top Daily kind of meets its eastern edge here. I see it in Navarro and Kaufman County a little bit, Ellis County too. But those are the tiny uh, three leaflets of, of Dahlia Hawaii. Usually you only see the leaves and then finally it flowers in the fall. And then all the Leatra species. So this is, you know, we got the sticky gay feather on the left, the, the summer gay feather. These are both on limestone, usually June, July bloomers. Uh, this was taken in April, a Leatris blooming in April in Ellis County. This one plant, I watched it all spring and it just kind of came up and bloomed. Uh, Leatris estivalis, summer gay feather. There's Pontata, our furry gay feather. Uh, here's Aspera, rough gay feather on kind of clay pan, sandier soils. Leatris pycnostachia, uh, Leaziophila variety. So this is the cattail gay feather that grows in acidic pitcher plant bogs or wet swales in sandy country. And then we got Leatris sclerosa, which likes clay pans and rockier kind of iron ore type soils. Uh, but all these do occur kind of in the area. And then milkweed. So Veritiflora, you know, we got Asperula, uh, Verticillata, the world milkweed. Uh, green, green milkweed, Asclepias viridis. This is sand milkweed from Gus England, Asclepias arenaria. And then uh, a clay, rocky loving uh, Metelia, the milk vines is, is Metelia biflora. And I'm not sure why that's there. That was a mistake making this past PowerPoint. So, and of course, these guys love the milkweed. So we always got to do something for our friends and monarchs in our yard. So add some of those if they're adapted to your ecological site. So again, I don't know how long this presentation was. It was not an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, I tried to get through as quick as I could, but just know that prairies are complex. You know, there's disturbance, things that are needed to kind of keep them intact and diverse. Uh, figure out what that might be for your landscape. Uh, understand there are above, at, and below ground processes, you know, in the soil uh, and above that are kind of doing its thing. Understand structure disturbance and scale. Know Leopold's five tools if you're going to do some management. Know your plants and how to manipulate. All right, so know what species you want to have, what you see that comes up. Try to learn all the species in your yard or in your area. And then if you need something, reach out. I'm always available. There's a whole list of county biologists around the state if you live somewhere else. Uh, I'm actually outside of my district here, so we have a biologist that's in Tarrant County, Jennifer Barrow. Um, but she let me come over and sneak in and give this presentation, I guess. So, uh, But there's a whole list of us, and there's experts, too, that do certain things. We have a reptile guy, a bird person, a mammologist, all that other good stuff. And with that, uh, Big Blue Stem is going to close us off um, from last fall, and any questions at all? Yes, ma'am. So, uh, sorry, the question uh, there was, is it too wet for buffalo grass? And, and definitely not. So, I mean, I think I see buffalo grass on several ranches and, and pastures, you know, Dallas County. I think it's more of a Western plant where you see more of it as you go West. So I think here it probably does really well. Uh, the problem I see with buffalo grass as a yard grass is it, it doesn't quite outcompete Bermuda or some of the other stuff. It, it just, cause it, it doesn't get very tall. It's a great grass with deep roots. A very good native, but it, it just doesn't have that competitive ability. Um, it might depend on your soil type too, but in our rainfall zone, it'll grow, but it won't persist and dominate that well. I usually just see it in, in lower wet sites here and there, you know, maybe in a river bottom, kind of open pasture in the, in the lower pasture. So. so we have a Zoom question. Okay. <clears throat> um, Knudsen wants to know, are there any articles on prairies attracting or repelling rats near buildings? Next question, do, do prairies uh, basically attract or detract from rats and stuff near buildings? So uh, I've always been told and known, we get a lot of questions about brush piles, you know, or thick patches on your property. We always call that rabbitat. Rab rabbit is another type of rodent. So anytime you have thick, brushy stuff or whatever, you'll attract rodents more. So uh, prairies are home for small mammals too. And so I don't think that would deter rodents away. Uh, if it was just an open, you know, uh, yard or lawn like most folks you know might have, it, it probably would be better at, at the prairie. So I think it would attract, you know, rodents more to the yard, so. So I have one question. So if you were going to compare mowing, most of us that have an acre mm -hmm. to two acres don't really have access to cattle. Sure. So if you were going to compare mowing to renting goats, what does that, how does that change for the landscape? Which one 
actually benefits the land more or do they do different things? It, again, it depends. So the, the question is, you know, how uh, the difference between mowing and goats or grazers can, can vary, uh, you know, especially in a yard or urban type situation. So uh, for me, you know, it just, it depends. As a scientist, I have to say it depends. You know, it's almost always the answer to a landowner or anybody asking. Uh, it depends on what your goals are and what you have. Obviously, mowing is just going to lay that thatch down on the ground. And so you're just going to create more thick layers of thatch over time. Uh, it does allow and encourage some plant species, you know, grasses that can get up above that thatch to do well in some forms too. You know, grazing is going to remove that from that particular site, right? So they're going to eat the plant, digest it, and do their thing, you know, and so uh, a little bit of both. You might mow every now and then when you can't get a grazer in there or burn it. So I would tell landowners, you know, if you miss a year burning, just mow a little patch here, mow a little patch here, graze where you can. Just that mosaic. Do a little bit here, a little bit there, just kind of change it up to add diversity. Because you'll get a lot of annuals on one side or more perennials here if you leave it alone. So it just kind of depends on what your goals are and what you have on your, your property. So what is disking? I forget my dog. Sure, good question. And and I did not discover. So you asked uh, what is disking. And so I didn't go to depth on that. So disking is a tractor implementation or you know, even a tiller type thing. So just lightly digging into the top layer of the soil. So it's creating kind of a, a disturbance. So what that does is it's kind of like fire. It just it encourages a lot of annuals and seed producing plants like sunflower to come up. And so one practice for, for landowners or, or property, you know, is to disc strips if the, if the elevation is right. So if it's really steep, we don't say to disc too much because it'll increase erosion issues. Uh, but just disking five, 10, 15 acre strips through a pasture or, you know, doing a, a network of, of disking. So. Too much sure. Yeah. yeah. It would help to kind of break it up and add some different things, but again, just be mindful of what response you might get in your yard from that. So if you historically had a lot of non-natives or bad non-native, you know, weed species, those might explode after doing too much disturbance. You know, so uh, even with burning, you're going to encourage non-natives. So just have an idea of what you might have on your place. Try it in, in bits and pieces first, or if you know somebody that's tried it before. And that way you can know maybe what to expect if you if you do. So. When should you mow it? Fall and winter. So kind of when you might would burn, but generally kind of let the birds nest and all the pollinators do their thing. Most of them are coming through in the spring and summer. But wait till October, November or later to, to mow. And every now and then you can mow in the summer if you need to, but wait till after July, all the birds to get done. And so. I didn't mow it. It made it everyone made it. Sure. Yeah. And there's always unintended and intended consequences of disturbance. So it's not an easy, hey, this is going to happen or this isn't. It's trial and error and kind of recognizing what might come up. So, well, I'm glad to got you. Yeah, sure. Sure. No problem. Thank you very much for, for that. So I'm, I'm glad to come back and break it down over Zoom or do something else later on. More details on a certain topic if you like. But, uh, but sure. Thank you very much.